to talk about revision internal fixation for uh, plafond injuries and whether or not it's worth it. Uh, this is just an example of the impact that we're having to contend with these days that we used to not have to see as much as we do now because of the advent of the airbag. And I think by virtue of that injury occurring because of the axial impaction, we are dealing with a big animal that is sometimes very difficult to overcome. Because when you see an injury of this magnitude, uh, it's really hard to think of anything good about what the outcome will be with respect to this patient. Uh, he presented to us at three and a half weeks, and we'll talk about him at the end. But the point is, when you see this, you realize that uh, when I tell you some of the uh, other factors associated with it, you really wonder if it's worth the effort. Uh, and I have to tell you that I still believe, and I still try to maintain when I talk about this that I think it's the most challenging orthopedic intervention that we do in terms of uh, reconstruction because of the soft tissue and bony components of it and then also because of what happens if it fails in terms of uh, the patient's future, especially if they're young. It's a really a, a difficult problem that uh, I'm not sure we really have an answer because when you look at all the salvage options that are available for this injury, uh, they're all a compromise. No matter what we'd like to think, we'd love to think optimistically, but osteotomies, debridements, arthrodesis, or ankle replacements all have a caveat of problems related to uh, when they're done, especially in a younger individual. Uh, this is just a paper from Costa et al. from Iowa demonstrating that uh, if a patient has a good fusion, in other words, a good arthrodesis position, they are essentially routinely <coughs> presenting later with a phenomenon such as you see here. This is a 30-year-old woman who at age 20 had an ankle arthrodesis well done, but as you can see at age 30, her primary symptoms are now in her subtater joint, and what do we do now at age 30? Uh, I was uh, able to see the evolution of Dr. Hansen's use of total ankle arthroplasty as a way of trying to manage uh, arthrosis rather than doing arthrodesis, which he was tired of doing because of what he saw in those secondary phenomena, so he was very really the pivotal person that really brought this to the forepart. But because he started in 95, uh, we now see what is a result of this. In other words, with outcome data now, even you look at patients that are young, that have a arthroplasty at a young age, they develop this uh, relatively routine polyethylene wear debris that is quite dramatic and it's uh, actually quite scary and it's uh, probably more rapid than what we see in the hip and the knee. So what can we do to address this cascade? Well, we're the pivotal intervention that can hopefully address perhaps this cascade and our index treatment is really pivotal, I think. Uh, and I think despite seeing some daunting challenges, you have to remain optimistic. If you look at the foot position, it really determines the fracture pattern. And the standard plafond injury uh, with an axial load only involves a slight bit of anterior translation or impaction of the front. That's in a neutral foot position. But the complications essentially are that we're seeing now, especially with the high energy injuries, are really related to, as you see here, union uh, as a problem. And usually it's not the articular segment, but the metadiaxial segment. And then late deformity as a result of that. Uh, the other problems are also uh, illustrative with every type of pilon. There's this nihilism that these are bad injuries, the patients are going to do poorly, so my success as a surgeon would be not to become involved and not have any acute complications related to my intervention on this devastating injury. And I would submit to you that uh, as I've tried to do and many of the things that I've uh, been exposed to is to address the reduction and how can I obtain a reduction and maintain it. Uh, this is just one of my mentors, Tom Rudy, who looked at his results from Coor in a 11 year period and you see that his difficulties were always with the higher energy injuries and you look here on the bottom right, the poor reconstructions involving the B3 lesions, which is the injury that uh, really is the posterolateral lateral fragment that's not reduced, and the C3 lesion are the two bugaboos that we continually have problems with. And here's just an example of that. Here's a, looks like a not a very complicated plafond injury. Uh, this is a post-op 
evaluation and those of you that are critical can look and see that there's going to be a problem and we've termed this the OIF. I started seeing the dropping of the R part in our reconstructions and this is essentially what ends up happening when you have malalignment interarticular hardware and a failure of support of the articular surface. It's a routine progression to arthrosis that you can't really recover from uh, without unfortunately a, um, an arthrodesis. So I learned from Tom Rudy, and I remember very distinctly when I was a fellow uh, seeing the angst he had in trying to fix both bones in one sitting. In other words, fix the fibula and the tibia in one operation. And uh, at around the two hour mark, he started get sweating and started uh, becoming more and more agitated because he'd spent a significant portion of his time fixing the fibula prior to addressing the tibia. Uh, the, this was through an antromedial approach, and uh, I, I realized that that was pivotal in terms of the soft tissue management. But then we started seeing a different phenomenon, and this was the anterolateral impaction, where if someone is slamming their foot on the brake, you have a different type of injury where the foot is extruded out the front of the ankle. And I remember Ted telling me in 86, he said, this is a bad problem because the anterior segments are so devitalized. But what we see in the failures are articular surface failures, perhaps from the injury that lead to arthrosis or avascular collapse. That's a big problem that we're seeing now. And is it, it's probably primarily from the injury, if you can look at that video clip. Uh, then we have the more significant problems that actually we can address, which are metadiocele non-union and or collapse. And I, I show this case, this is an example of a relatively elementary plafond injury. When you look at the uh, views from the top, you don't really appreciate the impaction that's occurred in the posterior aspect of the ankle and the restoration of what we call the roof of the ankle is really pivotal. And being able to reestablish the cover of the talus is I think a pivotal thing that we have to work on that really leads to the progression of good ankle function rather than the subsequent extrusion that we saw in arthrosis. So the reason for failure really the injury, uh, perhaps the host, and then unfortunately all these hosts of surgical management problems that we've had including soft tissues, bone, and the cartilage recovery. Buttress failure is pretty evident that um, this doesn't work in the face of uh, external fixation because that needs to be removed. This is an external fixer that was placed and you can see that it just doesn't hold on long enough. And then you get secondary impingements because of this malalignment. This is a great example of the way I treated tibia fractures, which was always in casts, and you get this characteristic air varus extension malunion that leads to arthrosis because if you drop a perpendicular down the leg, you see that the uh, talus is really in front of the weight-bearing line. Uh, this is just another more dramatic example of how uh, we see this extrusion of the talus anteriorly as a result of the malalignment at the metadiasis. Here's just another example of that problem. Uh, this is a patient who had a a closed plevon injury, beautifully reduced with an external fixator, but unfortunately nothing happened after that. So the frame needed to come off within about six or eight weeks, and then a progressive deformity ensued. And you can see that malalignment, it's really quite dramatic on the lateral view. And you can see the characteristic uh, external fixator pins that were used to reduce this, necessitating removal of the implant because of pin track problems. And the reconstruction really is, in this case, we did a opening wedge osteotomy from the back to try to reestablish the ankle, this, this roof, so to speak, but you can see that routinely these people will then potentially have impingement because of this hypertrophy of the front that is a little bit different than you see on this contralateral side. And so this anterior impingement was doing a non-destructive chylectomy where you're removing the bone that actually is impinging on the tibia in the front. This is just an example that shows you how a destructive chylectomy can quickly end the life of an ankle. And this is an example of a patient who had the front of the tibia debrided rather than the talus. And what happens? Avascular collapse is still a problem that I, I'm not really sure why it happens in certain situations because uh, some of them we see clearly because of the mechanism of the injury, but we have um, a clear problem with aseptic or septic avascular collapse. Here's a patient that was beautifully reestablished by uh, Dave Bray, and it uh, just slowly resulted in extrusion and collapse of the front. And essentially, the challenge there is to be able to reconstruct the ankle and bring the talus back into the tibia, which is not necessarily an easy challenge. Metadaxial problems are fortunately uh, ones that you can address. Delayed and non-unions are the ones that we try to uh, look at and perhaps preemptively treat. But here's an example a patient sent to us because she needed supposedly a free tissue transfer for an open wound here, but really what she needed was a, a reduction of her ankle and closure of her medial wound with bone grafting from the anterolateral side, and that was done in this patient. And with a, a strong enough implant, this went on to unite. 
However, this is what we see a lot now. This is a, the, the next extreme of oif. There's the locked oif, meaning that the, uh, the limb is, is not really brought out to length, as you can see here. The fibula is still short, and then the medial wound that occurred here was closed, but unfortunately in a significantly shortened position. So this required a sequential reconstruction at greater than a month where we had to reestablish length, and that told us really what the defect was, and wait for that wound to heal, and then approaches from where you anterolaterally are reconstructing the joint, uh, establishing stability, and then um, bone grafting the defects, as Tom Rudy taught me. Open fractures are another group that probably illustrate the, the problems with the metadiasis. Here's an example that I bring this up to illustrate the importance of the, my partners that helped me at Harvard. This is a patient that came to me in 1989, I believe, and um, Doug Hanel was here, thank God, and he, uh, we, we treated this patient the night of injury. This is a, a significantly open injury. You can see his initial re, uh, injury. This is his reconstruction, and fortunately, uh, Doug was around to do a coverage procedure for me so I could do a later bone graft, and this patient's now uh, approaching 20 years from uh, his initial fixation. There are some daunting challenges that we get. This is my third airplane crash uh, that, where the patient survives, and they also um, have having, are having an MI in their crash, and so this is a patient who got revascularized uh, at the university and then came back over and Brad and uh, I basically put, started putting everything back together. This is an example of his lower extremity injury. This is a Buffon injury, uh, epsilon calcaneus fracture, a distal femur fracture, proximal tibia fracture. We put everything back together. Um, he's 65 years old. Uh, we did this uh, safely through an intermediate approach. Here he is early on. Uh, and uh, we were experimenting with uh, plates that we realize now are not stiff enough, but this is an example of a medial support that uh, we tried to span this huge defect. This was 90 cc's of allograft bone to fill this defect. Here he is at three months, and here he is at 10 months. And you can see this plate bends, as Chip was alluding to flexible fixation, unfortunately too flexible, and the stiff implant fails. Uh, this is prior to locking plates, and this is 10 months. But he does have a joint, uh, and that's, I think, the important thing. So we basically went in, took the broken implant out, and in this process, that we had to do a corrective osteotomy. Chunk and Flitty may remember this injury. Uh, and then we went on to provide intramental fixation for his uh, metatapsial nonunion. So our ultimate goals in a, in a salvage attempt is to restore congruity, to prevent deformity and avoid infection. Timing is everything, and this is an example of what not to do. This is a, a acute surgery in the face of a closed injury, what unfortunately happens many times. Going back to this patient, here's the outcome. This is now a 68-year-old male who's insulin-dependent diabetic who fell out of a tree. I don't know what he was doing up in that tree, but he came down, and unfortunately he has all these injuries. He was offered basically tibial calconeal arthrodesis as his option. He came to us, and you can see he also has a Taylor body fracture. We did things just the way uh, Tom Rudy taught me, fix the fibula, reestablish length, go back and fix the tibia. And here he is at two years, and uh, he goes away, and uh, he's happy. But I do have to tell you that the sobering future is we have to realize that the sequelae of road traffic accidents, which in 1990 was number nine, is now going to probably rise to number three by 2020. So we'll have a lot of work to do, and hopefully those fellows that we've trained can help us in that challenge. Thank you. Well, thank you, Steve. Andy Sands will be talking next. Here's the uh, ship with no port right now, hopefully with a place to uh, uh, land here in the near future. But we'll be talking about the next step from that is actually the ones that are not being able to be reconstructed or that are failed that maybe fusion may be the best option for these patients. Thanks, Cliff. So briefly then, there's been much talk over the last several years. Fusion works well. It's based not on outcome, but on x-ray studies. And there's been a move to arthroplasty. But do arthroplasties work better with respect to range of motion and gait patterns? And how long does each technique last? How many years can we get out of it? The opinion began that fusion was terrible. It locks up complex ankle and hind foot function. It leads inevitably to further arthritis and abnormal gait, right? That's what everyone thinks. So a couple of papers show that while most patients with a well-positioned arthrodesis walk without a limp, there is a cost with respect to velocity, VO2, and uh, compensation by motion of other small joints. There's a trend to maintain the ankle joint biologically and implant, which will be covered next. 
What about distraction arthroplasty? Well, the advantage is it preserves the joint and motion in younger patients. The disadvantage is the frame is not easy for patients to do. And in my opinion, the actual results contradict the published results. So implant arthroplasty gives a theoretical advantage of some motion. It saves the lower joints. But even a successful arthroplasty with implant has much motion at the show part joints versus the ankle. So the answer for me is that the pendulum is swinging. I previously did no fusions and all arthroplasty. And now I would say I'm doing some arthroplasty with more fusion. Uh, I believe ankle fusion is still the gold standard. It gives predictable results. It's durable, and there's high patient satisfaction. What about open? Well, the advantages are that there's no in situ fusion. There's better compression at the fusion site, easier correction of deformity, and you can be a bit more aggressive with joint preparation. And the bottom line is what matters most is good technique and maintaining important fusion principles with whatever technique you choose to use. So these principles include patient selection, rigid fixation, meticulous joint prep, the biology of the process, preserving soft tissues, and mechanical alignment. Uh, whatever choice of internal fixation you choose is okay. It's whatever you're comfortable with. Again, meticulous joint preparation is the most important step. This is where we take our time and make sure we do this right. And I'll use different instruments to make sure we have good visualization, and then carefully remove the articular cartilage, and then drill the subchondral bone. Uh, what about biology? So I've, like all of you, looked into all of the new commercial products available, and I would say that so far, I haven't found that they work better or even equal to proximal tibia or iliac. And then there are the mechanical considerations with regard to varus valgus in the hind foot and the ankle. Uh, previously, those of you who are older know that we were taught that uh, women should be fused in maximum plantar flexion, and that's no longer the case. We don't align things based on style or sex, and everyone is placed in neutral for proper mechanical advantage. Uh, regarding talus position, you want the talus back, but not as far back as previously uh, was taught, but certainly you don't want it extruded or even anterior. Now, with regard to arthroscopy, again, you're going to do the cartilage resection, prepare it down to, to cancellous bone, get established bleeding, and then the other advantage is you can place your guide wire if you're using a cannulated screw. You can see it come out in the plafond, and you can aim it where you need to aim it. Uh, the open order of operation regarding the screws, here's a case that I want to use for uh, illustration. It's a 51-year-old female with post-traumatic ankle arthritis. Of course, we start any procedure with a TAL and then decide what else needs to be done. This was a lateral incision, a transfibular osteotomy, and headless screws. Um, the lateral approach uh, is a straight lateral, and it allows access to the fibula and syndesmosis. You can see across the plafond. There's also an anteromedial approach, which allows you to access the gutter, and then the posteromedial approach for the home run screw. Uh, here's a 79-year-old male with failed previous ORIF, came from Europe. He's an older gentleman uh, with a bit of uh, Parkinson's, and um, his medial fixation was inadequate, and he just had a terrible varus deformity. And he had a blade plate fixed angle device, which uh, buttressed the ankle and uh, uh, led to um, proper healing of his uh, fusion. So then progressing down the speculum, here's an older male who is husky with Charcot, failed previous fusion attempt, and he had both a lateral and an anterior plate. Uh, his failed previous fusion attempt was probably because of an unrecognized uh, Charcot component. Now, Rene Marti always said that you can get great motion and that the hind foot opens up. Uh, in the um, show part joint, and you get compensatory range of motion, often to the point where it's difficult to tell if there's a fusion present. So you can see that after ankle fusion, people uh, can fool you, and it's very deceptive, and they have fairly good plantar flexion and dorsiflexion uh, that many people assume is through the ankle, which we know it isn't because it's fused. And so this is the 79-year-old gentleman. You can see that he doesn't have much arm swing, uh, but he does have a fairly good gait. And this is a younger lady who had arthritis, post-traumatic. And um, I would challenge someone who is casually looking at these without knowing 
uh, whether the person had an ankle fusion or not. So in summary, uh, for me, treatment of ankle arthritis is evolving, sometimes in reverse. Ankle fusion is an excellent treatment alternative for younger, more active patients. There are many effective fusion techniques. We should think about them and choose the most cost-efficient one whenever possible. Save the fibula when possible to allow conversion to TAR. Uh, the scope helps facilitate later conversion to uh, TAR and should be the technique of choice for routine fusions. And the open technique is now used more for infection cases, Charcot, and very bad deformity and bone loss or salvage cases. Thanks very much. Thanks, Andy. The uh, final component of this will be ankle arthroplasty as a salvage for some of these uh, failed tibial peel on fractures. And Dr. Hansen needs no introduction. Thanks very much. It's interesting that one of the reasons I'm still here, I guess good genes, but also the fact that I'm still learning. And I went through a tremendous evolution. First, uh, I thought ankle fusion was a thing to do for arthritis. And uh, I saw a lot of patients with bad ankle fusions. And I thought, well, that's, they didn't do them right. So we learned to do them better, get them in the right position, put screws in them, get them to heal solidly very quickly. And um, some of them, just like he showed, did beautifully. They, would, uh, they could walk without a limp, and they were, um, you could send a medical student in to examine their ankle, and they'd come back and say it's normal. And of course, this is because some of you don't know that the, the Germans call the ankles, ankles uh, the, uh, the upper and lower ankle. The, you can use the lower one, which has both flexion extension and inversion eversion to replace loss of the upper one for a while. The problem is it isn't made to do that. And if you take half of a universal joint and um, begin to use it uh, as your only ankle, it'll be fine for a while, but then depending on where it started, it'll gradually wear out, and then you've got a real problem. Because if you go from there to another fusion and the whole hind foot and ankle is totally stiff, those patients some of them do well if they will wear a rocker bottom shoe, which they don't often want to do. But if they will, they'll do fairly well. Others say, I want my leg off. I can't stand this. And we've done amputations for people with pantalar arthrodeses that just cannot stand the stiffness. The um, age group that you'd like to do total joints, whether it's a total ankle, total hip, total knee, is sometime after 60. But when you're around a trauma hospital, they show up sometimes at 30 because they've got post-traumatic arthrosis, which is the most common type. So we have to do sometimes things earlier. It's interesting that uh, Rod Beal sent me a 25-year-old one time for a total ankle. And the reason was that she had been bugging him to take her leg off because she had had a talus fracture and she had ankle arthritis and subtalar arthritis. And he also knew that a pan tailor wasn't good. So he figured, well, no big deal. If she wants an amputation now, maybe she should have a um, total ankle. So we did that, but we were working with the older equipment. But she's a great example of what can happen because uh, she got then through school, got married, had a baby, and then she came back with it failing, as they always do. They will all fail virtually within about 10 years. And that's the one thing to tell everybody with an ankle problem is that you're going to we're going to learn to be friends. Every 10 years, we're going to have another operation of some type. And so uh, then she came back. And by that time, they had improved the things markedly. We have a custom stemmed arthroplasty. We had various other things to do. And we could say, well, OK, now we'll take that out. And we'll put in this new, new uh, technol technological improvements. And you'll be OK to go again. And that's what's happened. But she's getting near the uh, end of that one. <laughs> and we'll probably have to just do a poly exchange. But the, the, what I wanted to say overall about this is that we do need total ankles. And the trouble is they're not going to be everybody's going to do them. Because you need to do a lot of them because everyone is different in order to um, do them well. And you need to keep watching for the better technology coming along. Uh, but ankle fusion is a great operation if they've got a good subtalar joint and a good midfoot. Uh, and then you just have to convince the patient that they they'll do well with an ankle fusion. And the points that Andy's already made, uh, if you remind them that the subtalar joint will give them a good ankle for a while, uh, but also that when that one wears out, then you can go back. And the thing we do now is take the fusion down and put in a total ankle. And people don't, a lot of people don't believe that can happen because in the hip and knee, that doesn't work. But in the ankle, it works beautifully. 
providing, as again, as Andy's already said, you don't screw up the ankle fusion by taking away vital structures like the deltoid or the fibula or other things that are part of a lot of people's ankle fusion technique is to just get rid of that stuff. You must not do that. You gotta leave the, the, the tissue that you can use later to do the reconstruction. And we've pretty well proven, we also, we also proved that if you do it with a fibula out, they don't work. But if you do it with it in, they do work. And again, I have had to learn to love people, arthroscopists, in spite of what Andy says, because uh, they actually do the kind of fusion that is very easy to take down. Because they don't take everything away. They just go in and get the fusion, usually in a reasonable position. I don't do arthroscopy still, but I do appreciate the arthroscopists that are doing ankle fusions because they leave us something to work with, which is my major pitch here, is that whether you want to do total ankles or not, if you'd rather do a fusion, which I think is a good operation, leave us something to work with, which is it, it's, it's a perfectly good fusion to do it that way, as Andy's already shown the technique. Although he's going through the fibula and sometimes squeezing that down, I'd rather you didn't do that. Leave the full width of the uh, syndesmosis, so, and, by, and I go through the front and leave a zipper so we can keep going back every 10 years. And you can do whatever you want to go back and revise them. <coughs> but the main message is that ankle fusion is the first line of defense if the rest of the joint is okay. Then the next thing is uh, leave all the structures. I mean, do the ankle fusion when the, when the uh, uh, subtalar joint is okay, if that's what they like, and that's much better for the younger patients and the heavy working person and all the rest of it. This is a good example of um, a post-traumatic one. This is an old pilon, um, a 50-year-old dietitian who was about 200 pounds. She had a bad open pilon, and... Um, when I saw her first in the upper left-hand corner, it had done like a lot of them do. She'd sort of sunk into a little bit of valgus and a not very good union. And so we took out the hardware, as you see over in the middle picture, and put much lighter hardware in that didn't sh stress shield so much. Brought her back to neutral with an osteotomy, then let that heal. Then we went back in, and all of this through skin graft on the lateral side and so forth, and did a total ankle arthroplasty. And in spite of the fact that she uh, was a bit overweight, otherwise she was an ideal patient. Uh, and she took good care of that for about seven or eight years, and now I can't show the picture, but we've, she's had her revision back to a custom stemmed arthroplasty now and continues to do very well. She's now about 15 years out. And uh, this kind of shows the progress that you can make with this. And this lady uh, couldn't very well have had a, a, or she could have had a fusion, but it would have been hard to do with that abnormality. And, she was getting up to in the age group where she's perfectly all right with this. And that just shows kind of the example of what you can do. I'm going to stop there and uh, be glad to answer any questions.